Hello, I'm Michael Rickards, the Executive Director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy. And it was also my honor to be named the Chairman of the New Jersey Bicentennial Commission, honoring the 200th anniversary of the birthday of our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. Throughout the state, in 2009, we did a series of lectures and presentations on the president and his life and times. And then, in 2011, on February 21st, we did a series of events to mark his famous travel from Springfield, Illinois, to Washington, D.C. He stopped at several places in New Jersey, including Trenton, where he addressed the state legislature, addressing each body differently. This is the story of those events of February 21st. First, we went into the State House of New Jersey and there presented a plaque sponsored by the Hall Institute and its donor, George Hall, which acknowledged the 200th anniversary of the Great Emancipator. Above it was a plaque of the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's birthday as well. There, our Lincoln impersonator, Bob Costello, and other impersonators reenacted the welcome and also Lincoln's remarks to both houses of the state legislature. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of you coming here today. The whole institute is proud and its founder delighted to be able to donate this plaque honoring the 200th anniversary of the birth of the president. It's below the plaque that honors him for at his 100th birthday. And I assume there'll be one for the 300th but I won't be here to worry about that. <laughs> We're delighted to have the opportunity to say thank you to the committee that worked with me for three years. David has really been the inspiration for this. To my colleagues on the committee, Margaret, thank you very much. To other people who really have been a part of this. To my sister who did so much publicity for us, who was born on February 12th, Abraham Lincoln's birthday, and to my secretary, Eunice Lee, to whom this is such an important event. But most of all, thank you and thank you to the spirit of President Lincoln, who's upon us. It was near this building that Lincoln once said that the American people were an almost chosen people. I hope that in the future, we will indeed be the types of people that he would have been proud of. Mr. President, would you help me rip off this insignia? I hear that you're fairly strong. We then processed with the president and with the reenactors to the sound of some great Civil War music to the State Museum, where once again Lincoln gave the two addresses for which he's become famous, in which he called the Americans an almost chosen people, and in which he promised that he would stand strong against the forces of secession. I would like to reconstruct Lincoln's visit in Trenton with a timeline and a detailed account of what happened through his visit in Trenton. 11.50 a.m., Abraham Lincoln arrives at the Trenton train depot at the corner of East State Street and East Canal Street. The site is currently located next to the western corner of the federal courthouse on East State Street. It's across the street from the current Department of Environmental Protection building. Uh, it's also near where the East State Street is, becomes an overpass over Route 1, which at that point, uh, point in time was part of the uh, Delaware and Raritan Canal. At 11.55 a.m., Lincoln is greeted by Trenton Mayor Franklin S. Mills and the City Council in front of the Tremont House Hotel. Part of that hotel still stands at the corner of East State and West Canal Street across the street from the current Trenton City Hall. 
Mills welcomed Lincoln with a speech and offered to show him some of Trenton's Revolutionary War sites, which Lincoln kindly declined. From 12 noon to 12.10 p.m., there was a magnificent procession along State Street from the Tremont House Hotel to the State House. The parade consisted of cavalrymen with drawn swords, marching bands, and military units similar to those that are here today, followed by Lincoln in a stately carriage drawn by four bay horses. The carriage was loaned to the legislative committee that was charged with arranging Lincoln's visit for this purpose by James Buckaloo of Jamesburg, New Jersey. And the carriage has been preserved by the Jamesburg Historical Society and is still in existence. Uh, we have a photograph of it on our display over the state capitol, if you'd like to see it. Lincoln sat with Dayton, in, uh, William Dayton, in the back seat facing front of that carriage. Senator Jonathan Cook, Republican from Mercer County, and Assemblyman Socrates Tuttle, Republican from Bessea County, sat in the front seat of that carriage facing Lincoln. The top of the carriage was removed, I guess it was a convertible, for an opportunity for the public to see Lincoln better. Lincoln stood throughout the 10 minute voyage, bareheaded, without his hat, while the progress, procession progressed. According to a newspaper account, the thronged streets were violently agitated when Lincoln appeared. He bowed to the people and responded with tumult who responded with tumultuous shouts. Mothers held up their babes and many white-haired men appeared in the dense columns. At 12.10 p.m., Lincoln arrives at the State House. I would like to note that Mrs. Lincoln and sons Robert, William, and Tad who were seated in the carriage behind Lincoln in the procession, never actually entered the State House. Instead, they were the lunch guests of Mr. Dayton, whose residence was located now right where the State House annex is located. It's where he lived, right next to the State House. At 12.15 p.m., Lincoln enters the Senate chamber and is warmly greeted by Senate President Edmund Perry and gives a carefully prepared speech to the Senate when you hear Lincoln's speech reenacted in a few minutes, note the carefully prepared, even beautiful and flowery language used, particularly the famous clause he used to describe Americans as God's almost chosen people. It was the first and only time that Lincoln used that phrase. John Hay, one of Lincoln's personal secretaries who was present in the Senate chamber on that day, noted Lincoln's speech and delivery before the Senate was different from all the other Lincoln speeches that Hay had heard. In his memoirs, Hay writes that Lincoln's voice was, and I quote, as soft and sympathetic as a girl's, and although not lifted above the tone of average conversation, it was distinctly audible throughout the entire hall. It was a very important first-hand account of what happened, uh, of how Lincoln spoke on that day in the Senate chambers. Lincoln was frequently interrupted during his speech with applause, and at the, at the conclusion of his speech was beset by the throng all eager to grasp him by the hand. Indeed, after his speech, Lincoln was personally introduced to and shook hands with each and every member of the New Jersey Senate. At 12.30 p.m., Lincoln is escorted into the assembly chamber, where he is again warmly greeted by the presiding officer, Speaker Frederick Teese. Here, Lincoln gives an extemporaneous, not a prepared speech to the assembly. Just a, a, a footnote here, the assembly had opened their session at 10 a.m. that morning and adjourned at 11.30 to wait for Lincoln. Between 11.30 and 12.30, when Lincoln finally arrived, as they impatiently waited for him, four satirical resolutions were introduced to amuse themselves. Lincoln never heard them himself. They were recorded in the official minutes, and thanks to the state archives, they're preserved and for the next month are going to be displayed in the state, uh, the state house at Rotunda, and I encourage you to take a look at what those resolutions said. As I said, Lincoln's speech before the assembly was extemporaneous, unlike his Senate speech. We know this for several reasons. Listen carefully to the speech to the assembly that will shortly be read. Gone is the flowery Lincoln-esque language used before the Senate. Here we have a colloquial down-to-earth Lincoln saying that he might have to put the foot down when dealing with the southern states. Why was his speech before the New Jersey Assembly extemporaneous? Because 
Whenever Lincoln spoke before a, late, a, a state legislature on his inaugural journey, and he did so in Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, Albany, New York, in Trenton, New Jersey, and Harrisburg, right, with the exception of, of New Jersey, they all assembled in a joint meeting of a legislature, as was customary and a tradition. New Jersey actually threw poor old Abe a curveball by a meeting in two separate houses thereby requiring two separate speeches, while Lincoln only brought one speech with him. This put Lincoln on the spot, forcing him to speak ad lib and reverting to such colorful language as put the foot down. This may have been Lincoln's first public intimation of the possibility of war. I would like to share with you three eyewitness accounts of Lincoln's speech in the assembly chambers. One is a Hunterdon County newspaper that reported the anxiety to see the president at this juncture was immense. The audience in the chambers rose almost in mass, crowding, pushing, and surging from side to side in ineffectual efforts to gratify their curiosity. While cries of, down in front, take off your hat, keep your seats, where's the president? Shh, mingled with the sharp tones and raps of the speaker calling to order have to the occasion added nothing but an aspect that added to aspect of legislative dignity. Prompt to solve the difficulty, however, Mr. Lincoln ascended the rostrum and there, his form towering head and shoulders above all others and within sight of every eye, the audience hushed to silence. Secondly, uh, I'd like to relate a excerpt from a letter written by Richard B. Duane, who I don't think anybody here have heard, has heard of, to Major Richard Anderson, who I bet most of you have heard of. Anderson was the commander of Fort Sumter and was there at the attack on Fort Sumter. And it turns out that Richard B. Duane was a pastor, a pastor from Trenton, New Jersey, whose job it was that day was to give the invocation before the House of Assembly, which was the tradition in, in New Jersey to this day that a, a, a pastor would give a blessing before the proceedings began. Well, that duty fell to Mr. Duane on that day. Mr. Duane, in that letter, writes to Anderson, who was actually his friend, and he writes in quote, Mr. Lincoln was here today and had a truly noble reception. It was my day to serve as chaplain to the House of Assembly at the legislature, so I saw his reception there. I stood within six feet of him when he made his address. It was very kind, conciliatory in word, manner, and tone, even gentle, but firm as adamant. He said the time might come when it would be necessary to put the foot down. He accompanied this with a very decided and appropriate gesture and paused. And one cheer went up from the assembled hundred there. He added, I hope if that is the case, you will all stand by me. The response was emphatic. Mr. Lincoln made a very favorable impression here. A third eyewitness was from John Hay, Lincoln's secretary. Lincoln's unusual statement that he may have to put the foot down was made, according to Hay, in quotes, with great deliberation and with a subdued intensity of tone. And to emphasize their meaning, he lifted his foot lightly and pressed it with a quick, but not too violent gesture on the floor. He evidently meant it. Hay added that he had never seen an assemblage more thoroughly captivated and tranced by a speaker than were the listeners that day in the New Jersey Assembly. Of historical significance, Lincoln's extemporaneous statement was his clearest statement throughout his inaugural journey that military action might be necessary to preserve the Union. And that statement was made here in Trenton in the State House. The statement was quoted widely in the next day's newspapers in Trenton and some national papers. After the, after the assembly speech, 1 o'clock p.m., Lincoln legislators and in, invited guests were uh, arrive at the Trenton House Hotel, located at the corner of Warren Street and Hanover Street. Greeted by a throng of people and a 150-gun salute, Lincoln enters the hotel and see, sits at the table of honor with Senate Pre uh, President Perry and Speaker Teese at his right and left. After a call for another speech, Lincoln appears on a staging of the second floor of the hotel. After, uh, sorry, he returns to his meal. Including members of the legislature, about 400 guests partook 
of the collation to a short, brief lunch. Terrapin, oysters, cold cuts, champagne, and confectionery. It was reported that Lincoln abstained from indulging with the, with the champagne. A newspaper reported that Lincoln was apparently impressed with the food and he asked to be taken to the kitchen where he chatted with the chefs and their staff. His secretary, John Hay, however, complained that the lunch was, as he wrote in his memoirs, imperfectly arranged. Those who had forks could find but little to put those utensils into. Those who were surrounded by all the luxurious cold cuts had no forks. After an hour of dining and relaxation, Lincoln was quietly escorted back to the train depot, the route being along Hanover Street, to Stockton Street, back on East State Street, and then to the station by 12.30 p.m. when the train left for the next stop on his inaugural journey, Philadelphia. I thank you all. In the name and on behalf of the legislature of the state of New Jersey, I welcome you to the capital of our state. Elected to the high and responsible office of President of the United States, you are soon to take upon yourself the solemn duties to which you have been called. You go to preside over the destinies of this vast country at a time of great distraction and imminent peril, when the hearts of all true patriots are filled with anxiety and solitude when the sons of liberty stand appalled at the approaching crisis, that you may receive from on high wisdom to direct and the strength to sustain you in the discharge of the laborious duties of your high office, and that you may succeed as to the merit of the universal planet of well done, good and faithful servant is. I am sure today the prayer of millions of free men Go, honored sir, to your great task, and may God go with you. Thank you. Mr. President, gentlemen of the Senate of the State of New Jersey, I am very grateful to you for the honorable reception of which I have been the object. I cannot but remember the place that New Jersey holds in our early history. In the early revolutionary struggle, Few of the states among the old 13 had more battlefields of the country within their limits than old New Jersey. May I be pardoned if, upon this occasion, I mention that way back in my childhood, the earliest days of my being able to read, I got a hold of a small book, such a one as few of the younger members have ever seen, Weems' Life of Washington. I remember all the accounts there are given of the battlefields and struggles for liberties of the country. None fix themselves upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton, New Jersey. The crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at that time, all fix themselves upon my memory more than any single revolutionary event. And you all know, for you all have been boys, how these early impressions last longer than any others. I recollect thinking then, boy even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for. That's something even more than national independence. That's something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world, to all time to come. I am exceedingly anxious that this union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. I shall be most happy indeed if I shall be a humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty, and of this, his almost chosen people, for perpetuating the object of that great struggle. You give me this rep reception, as I understand, without distinction of party. I learn that this body is composed of a majority of gentlemen who, in the exercise of their best judgment and the choice of a chief magistrate, did not think I was the man. I understand, nevertheless, they came forward here to greet me as the constitutional president of the United States, as citizens of the United States, to meet the man who, for the time being, is the representative man of the nation, 
united by a purpose to perpetuate the union and the liberties of the people. As such, I accept this reception more gratefully than I could do did I believe it was tendered to me as an individual. On behalf of the General Assembly of the State of New Jersey, it gives me great pleasure, sir, to welcome you, the President-elect of our country, to the capital of our state. Under any circumstances, it would be most fitting for us to show our respects to the chosen Chief Magistrate of the Republic. But now, the best, the bravest, the wisest, stand still in doubt and awe at the posture of our national affairs. I am happy to give you, sir, the assurances of the descendants of those whose blood was shed in the cause of liberty upon this soil, of the continued devotion of this state to the Constitution and the Union founded by our fathers and that our people will heartily cooperate with you in all constitutional efforts for a speedy and peaceable settlement of the differences which now unhappily distract our country. We sympathize with you and the difficulties with which you are surrounded. Already have the dark clouds of disunion obscured a portion of those stars which lately shown in an undivided constellation. But we hope that counsels of wisdom and prudence will yet dispel those clouds, and that the close of your administration will witness us once more a united and harmonious nation. Sir, permit me to introduce you to the members of this House, and at the same time assure you of their respect and best wishes for yourself personally and to renew to you the assurance of our sincere desire to join with you in every effort for the promotion of the interest of our common country. Mr. Speaker and gentlemen, I have just enjoyed the honor of a reception by the other branch of the legislature and I return to you and them my thanks for the reception which the people of New Jersey have given. Through their chosen representatives to me as the representatives for the time being of the majesty of the people of the United States. I appropriate to myself very little of the demonstrations of respect of which I have been greeted. I think little should be given to any man, but that it should be a manifestation of adherence to the Union and the Constitution. I understand myself to be received here by the representatives of the people of New Jersey, a majority of whom differ in opinion from those with whom I have acted. This manifestation is therefore to be regarded by me as expressing their devotion to the Union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people. You, Mr. Speaker, have well said that it is time when the bravest and wisest look with doubt and awe upon the aspect presented by our national affairs. Under these circumstances, you will readily see why I should not speak in detail of the course until I deem it best to pursue. It is proper that I should avail myself of all the information and all the time at my command in order that when the time arrives in which I must speak officially, I should be able to take the ground which I deem best and safest, and from which I may have no occasion to swerve. I shall endeavor to take this ground I deem most just to the north, the east, the west, the south, and the whole country. I take it. I take it, I hope, in good temper, certainly no malice towards any section. I shall do all that I may in my power to promote a peaceful settlement of all our difficulties. The man does not live who is more devoted to peace than I am.
none who would do more to preserve it. But it may be necessary to put down the foot firmly. And if I do my duty and do it right, you will sustain me, will you not? Received as I am by the members of a legislature, the majority of whom do not agree with me in political statements, I trust that I may yet have their assistance in piloting the ship of state through this voyage, surrounded by perils as it is. For if it should suffer attack now, there will be no pilot ever needed for another voyage. Gentlemen, I have already spoken longer than I intended and must beg leave to stop here. I must say that my visit to New Jersey, while it has been a rapid trip through the state, for I do have duties in Washington that uh, I must tend to, uh, principally to take the oath of office, it has been an enjoyable visit. I know that there were some newspapers in the northern part of the state that had urged the people to come out and rally against me. I have seen no, no action as they request, but I have seen large crowds Friendly to me, friendly to Mrs. Lincoln and my family, for which I thank them. And I know that should the dark clouds of war come to us, that we're not able to settle our differences, that New Jersey will rally to the Union to preserve the Constitution. Coming through Jersey City, Newark, the other cities that I stopped in, the large crowds that were there, the enthusiasm that I saw takes me back to the remembrances of the, of the revolution, a time when people struggle for liberty. Now is the time for us to struggle to keep our union together. And I think that New Jersey will be foremost in that cause from what I've seen here today. It has been a very pleasant visit. I hope again to return here and to be greeted with the same enthusiasm that I've had today. So I thank you very much. At the end of all of these ceremonies and a reception, some people chose to go into the state archives and look at the flags that have fluttered over America at different times in its history. But these last several years have given the commission and the people of New Jersey an opportunity to honor one of its greatest presidents who helped define and redefine the very nature of democracy in America.